we're looking at an alternate Earth that is probably one of the most obvious ways to change things up. Earth 8311, also known as Larval Earth, is home to anthropomorphic animal superheroes. There are no humans here. Instead, this universe has what is called an anthropomorphic field that has an effect on animals, changing them into humanoid versions of themselves with the ability to speak. This happened to one of the inhuman Lockjaw's siblings. Her name was Doc Jaw. She was taken in by Mooster Fantastic, and yes, that's Mr. Fantastic as a moose. And he trained her to become a pretty accomplished scientist. But she is far from the only animal to make a name for themselves here. Arguably, the most well known of Larval Earth's denizens would be Peter Porker, aka Spider Ham. But others include Deer Devil, Nick Furry, the Agents of Sheep, and the one that caught me off guard the most, Black Panda. On the villainous side of things, we have Magsquito, Sand Manatee, and Kangaroo the Conqueror, which is just fantastic. Now, following the events of the Superhuman Civil War, people were a little bummed out. Understandably so. That little conflict didn't end in laughs, shaking hands, and happy smiles. It ended in tears, broken friendships, and fallen allies. So, naturally, Reed Richards can't just accept reality for what it is, and he goes searching for alternate Earths where things didn't go so badly in Dark Rain, Fantastic Four, Number two from April of 2009. But of course, things go south. A power outage causes Reed's machine to go a little off the chain. In an alternate timeline created by the machine, Susan Storm, the invisible woman, rules a medieval world taking the name Queen Storm. Her throne is flanked by her brother Johnny in full plate armor and the thing dressed like an aristocrat. She seems to be leading one side of a medieval superhuman civil war. We see Captain America, Iron Fist, Cable, Daredevil and Luke Cage Power Man as they prepare for a battle with a man with an iron heart who is just outside the castle preparing to attack with his group. Now before the conflict begins, we get to hear Chamberlain Grimm say his classic line, Milady, tis the clobbering hour, and it's fantastic. But before we can see more, we move to other alternate timelines. In Uncanny X-Men number 153, Kitty Pride has to tell Colossus's little sister Ileana a bedtime story. So what does she do? She comes up with an adorable little story recasting her friends as pirates, wizards, genies, and for one of my faves, Nightcrawler, Kitty turns him into little tiny nightcrawlers that look eerily like Smurfs that she calls Bamfs. At first, there's just one, and it pops up and immediately falls in love with Kitty before like 10 of the little guys start popping up. But this is a comic book. Why tell a bedtime story when that bedtime story could easily just become a completely different universe that actually exists? Thanks to a mishap in the X-Men's Danger Room, Nightcrawler is transported to another dimension where the characters from Kitty's story, including all the Bamps, really exist. And that place is Earth 5311. 1979's What If number 14 gives us a very different approach to history. Instead of World War II being fought in Europe, it is instead fought in space. In this alternate timeline, we discovered interstellar travel much earlier in our history, and as such, the World War II we fight is more like space sector war between sector alpha and sector beta in space. And I do not know where that is. As this is still set at the same general time as the regular World War II, some of the same characters are going to be involved, including the original Nick Fury and his Howling Commandos. This story has new high-tech weaponry, fishbowl, helmets and aliens and it's just a good bit of fun. Now we learn in the story that Admiral Von Strucker is actually working with the alien Axis powers to create a master race. So it seems that even in this alternate world where we can master interstellar travel, we can't really just figure out racism. Now in the alternate reality of AD 3167, which appeared in Extraordinary X-Men number 11 from June 2016, Apocalypse showed up in the 21st century bringing with him the Great Trials. Now this event saw the end of entire civilizations and races on Earth and left only the Atlanteans, the Inhumans, an AI race known as the Stark Self, the Wakandans, the Mystics, and the Maloids. And they all lived under Apocalypse's rule on Omega World. This was a huge structure composed of bubble worlds that preserved what little remained of Earth after Apocalypse's ascension. The part that will blow your mind is that Omega World itself, the entire 
entire structure is Apocalypse. He still had a human form, and that essentially functioned as the Omega World's heart, keeping the whole place functional. At the same time, his horsemen functioned as like Omega World's antibodies, being sent out to cleanse the structure of anything that could harm their master. The mutant Colossus and a bunch of young mutants were transported here, where Colossus was captured and became another of Apocalypse's horsemen. Apocalypse was now after an arc being held by the mutant kids that contained thousands of mutant embryos. He should have left it all alone though, because it got him a good old sword in the back by the end of the story. That doesn't matter though, because the world is cool. Taking place on Earth 97161, Simon Walterson was a pretty killer football player whose career came crashing down due to a knee injury. Simon found the love of his life, married her, had a kid, and then they both passed away. But wait, it gets even worse. Simon got himself cursed by a witch after he wasn't able to pay her for connecting him with his wife and child in the afterlife. Now this curse turned Simon from a strapping man into a frog. Simon luckily found himself being accepted into a frog clan that lived in Central Park, and Simon took on the frog name of Puddlegup. Now, Puddlegup managed to assist the god of thunder Thor in a war between rats and frogs. After the fight, a piece of Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, was broken off, and Puddlegup was able to lift the sliver of hammer, which then transformed into a miniature version of Thor's hammer, and it turned Puddlegup into the mighty Throg, a frog with the powers of Thor. This world is the home of the Pet Avengers, a group of animals who belong to or are related in some way to various superheroes and who manage to form together as a team. Fantastic. Neil Gaiman's Marvel 1602 is one of my favorite comic book stories, but I will admit it can be a little weird. Basically, to lay it out, the universe the story takes place in, Earth 311, actually got its start in a different alternate reality. On Earth 460, Purple Man had used his powers of persuasion to become president for life. In that world, most heroes had been hunted down or had died from old age, but Captain America was one holdout. Unfortunately, he is captured and banished away to Earth 616's 1599. But because he showed up in the world, it inadvertently, and for some reason, created an entirely different alternate timeline known as Earth 311. For some reason, the presence of Captain in America destabilized reality and began the emergence of heroes and villains into this world who are counterparts to many of the present day heroes and villains of the Marvel Universe that we are used to. Characters like Count Otto Von Doom the Handsome, Witchbreed, who are actually mutants, Four from the Fantastic, Sir Nicholas Fury, David Banner, all these guys. These are some of the alternate versions of these characters. The story is so interesting, intertwining actual history with super powered beings, but it's not without its confusing moments, and most of that has to do with how this story's world even came to be in the first place. While originally a crossover advertisement deal between Marvel Comics and Hostess, you know, the company that owns Twinkies, Snowballs, and those cupcake snack pastries, the Spider-Man of Earth 51914 is an official member of the Spider-Verse, being defeated by Morlun in the first Spider-Verse comic in 2014. But Morlun has defeated many spider totems, it's his whole thing. This Spider-Man is still more powerful than you may think. Think. This sweet Spider-Man has all the same powers as our 616 Spider-based hero, only has the added benefit of using Hostess snacks as equipment, whether it be to distract, lure, or even reason with criminals. And it even got him out of tight spots in his relationships. Like when he gave Mary Jane a cupcake so that he could slip away to fight crime. The power of sweet pastries should not be undervalued. Now using his pastry based equipment, he was able to defeat the fly, printout man, Simon the evil Swami, Madam Web, Legal Eagle, and an unnamed jewel thief. So yeah, it's not just a sponsor, it's an actual added ability that puts him a cut above. Unfortunately, this all happened before Morlun showed up and sucked out Hosty Spidey's life force, which was apparently quite sweet. Marvel Max was a 2001 imprint for Marvel that focused on more mature adult stories. As a result, the books were pretty over the top, and that was really their selling factor. But some were just incredibly weird, like the Eternal Max. Essentially, the Eternal Max follows the Eternals, but other than being the immortal servants of the Celestials, these guys are quite different. Taking place just before the dawn of mankind, the Eternals had been serving the Celestials for thousands of years, traveling from planets 
planet to planet to mine resources. When the Eternals arrive on a planet, they genetically modify some of the local intelligent life into artificial Eternals, which they call Deviants, and they use them as manual labor to make the job easier. When they arrive on Earth though, they do the same thing, turning the proto-humans into Deviants. But these Deviants are shockingly similar to the Eternals, who are also shockingly similar to us. Now in the past, the Celestials wiped out every single one of the female Eternals in order to force the male Eternals into servitude. So when these new Deviants are created, the male Eternals get all googly eyed for the female Deviants. A large number of the Eternals go against the rules and teach the Deviants how to communicate and they begin to procreate with them. This leads to essentially a mini civil war among the Eternals between their leader Ikadin and the second in command, Karasis. It all leads into the Eternals and these Deviants basically becoming the first real humans on Earth. At least that's kind of how I interpreted it. If you are over the age of 18, definitely give it a read because it is really interesting, but also very mature. And finally, if you have never read Marvel, just prepare yourself. This comic kind of just goes and doesn't really stop. The entire thing is satire, but like not good satire, like at all. All. There's even a page in each issue dedicated to explaining the jokes, and the story itself barely has any kind of actual plot. It's just, well, it was all part of a bet. In 2002, Bill Jemis was vice president at Marvel Comics. He got into an argument with Peter David, and the two of them made a bet. Each would write a comic book starting from issue number one to see whose comic could sell more copies. Peter started Captain Marvel, and Bill started Marvel. Marvel featured a Superman parody named Cal AOL, who is the son of Ted Turner and Jane Fonda. It features a farting dog, a racist Iron Man, a farting Rush Limbaugh, scantily clad women for no reason, time travel for no reason, a person who may or may not be God, duckbill dinosaurs that talk, rants about how evolution is fake, and then, what is probably the highlight of the comic, they grab a Jurassic otter, and as they move closer to the modern day, that otter not only evolves to become Wolverine, but that otter Wolverine is also the father of the entire human race. Coming in at number 10 is the tale of Ice Giant Thor. A perfect what if tale. It's almost surprising that it wasn't done before this point. In What If Thor in 2018, we get the story of what if Thor was raised by frost giants instead of Loki being raised by Asgardians. Simple, but brilliant. Laufey, the king of the frost giants, defeats Odin in their battle so, so long ago. And just as Odin took the infant Loki, Laufey takes the kid Thor and raises him as his own. Loki is obviously here too, and like usual, they form a pretty tight bond as adoptive brothers, Loki and Thor. Unfortunately though, due to Thor's strength and skill in battle, not to mention his fondness for summoning the power of lightning, he is praised among the frost giants and by Laufey himself, who begins to completely forget Loki, his actual true son. Instead, Loki finds the captured Freya in the dungeons and she teaches him how to use magic. Loki eventually busts her out of prison and together they attempt to escape to Midgard. They go to the ruins of old Asgard and attempt to repair the Rainbow Bridge until Thor and Laufey show up. Loki ends the life of his father while Thor unknowingly ends his mother with a blast from his giant ice hammer known as Ice Crusher. Thor almost takes out his brother as well but at the last minute, he lets him go. Now we don't know what happens next, only that Loki went to Midgard, had kids and a family, and apparently became a hero. It ends on a rather sweet note, and I think that's lovely. Number nine, Fantastic Four as cosmonauts? Next, let's explore the what if story that begs the question of what if the Fantastic Four were Russian. Well, for starters, their name is different. In fact, actually, they're pretty much all different. Now called the UFFF, or the Ultimate Federalist Freedom Fighters, the team is made up of Rudion Richards, the Kami Reed Richards who instead of stretching can just pop off his limbs and send them out over long distances, which is way more alarming than having to stretch. Natalia Romanova, the 616 Black Widow, is also on the team as Widowmaker and can control electromagnetic energy. Pyotr Rasputin is also on the team, but he's still just Colossus and has all those powers, except his body and mind are deteriorating over time. And lastly, his sister, Ileana Rasputina, is also on the team who seems to have the powers of Sue Storm, but we only ever see her go invisible, which is way less cool. 
rule. After the demise of Stalin in this history, the team is put under the KGB control and Rudd Richards, easily the strangest member of the team, is not okay with it. Especially after he accidentally ended the life of Giant Man while on a mission. Widowmaker makes widows of the wives of the leaders of the KGB and the superhero team goes on to fight for freedom and equality, which is not at all how I thought this story would go. But hey, it's good. Number eight, Jane Foster becomes Thor. Now, thankfully, Jane Foster as Thor has happened in the true 616 continuity, and it was really, really, really awesome. But here, it's a little different in this what if story. Number 10, actually. It is Jane Foster who first picks up the hammer Mjolnir, not Donald Blake. In this story, Jane accompanies Dr. Blake on his trip to Norway, and when he drops his cane into a ravine in the original, she instead goes down there to get it for him. Striking the stick on the ground, just like Donna Blake would have, she becomes Thordis. Yes, Thordis. Unlike the modern interpretation, a female wielding Mjolnir gets an entirely new name in this what if. Wielding the power of Thor, Thordis fights off the Saturn rock people and then turns the cane that she seems to have just stolen from Donald Blake into a hairbrush to better fit in with her feminine alter ego, I guess, because men don't use hairbrushes. She has pretty much the same adventures as Thor, but crucially, she is rejected by Odin for not being a man. Oh, and for some reason, Sif gets with Donald Blake, which is kind of weird. This tracks all the way up until the events of Ragnarok when Odin decides to give the hammer back to Donald Blake because he can't accept Jane as Thor. And then, as thanks, he turns Jane into a different god and then marries her. It's kind of gross, it's kind of really strange, it's kind of uncomfortable, but luckily it's only a story that comes from asking the question, what if? Number seven, World War II Space Nick Fury. 1979's What If number 14 gives us a very different approach to history. Instead of World War II being fought in Europe, it is instead fought in space. In this alternate timeline, we discovered interstellar travel much earlier in our history, and as such, the World War II we fight is more like space sector war between sector alpha and sector beta in space. And don't ask me to define where those areas are because I cannot. I don't know how space works. As this is still set at the same general time as the regular World War II though, some of the same characters are going to be involved, including the original Nick Fury and his Howling Commandos. This story has new high-tech weaponry, fishbowl helmets, and aliens, and it's a good bit of fun. We learn in the story that Admiral Von Strucker is actually working with the alien Axis powers to create a master race. So it seems that in this alternate world, we can master interstellar travel, but we still just can't accept each other for our differences yet. Damn, that's kind of realistic, ain't it? Number six, Civil War Captain America. Honestly, I'm kind of a fan of this what if story, but it does have some strange moments and twists on characters that you might not expect. For example, the story starts out with our Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes time displaced to the Civil War era. Bucky is the commander of a regiment and he is not a good guy. Apart from being an unhealthy amount of racist, he has quite the lack of moral compass. Our Steve, however, obviously starts out as his scrawny and less than impressive self, but with a heart that shines through as strong and good as gold. After sustaining injuries from not following his commander's orders, he is recovering in a nearby Union camp, tended to by a private Wilson, taken in by the Shawnee at a young age. Sensing the goodness in his heart, Wilson bestows a kind of eagle animal spirit on Mr. Rogers that makes you on the outside whatever you are on the inside. That's how he describes it. And this happens just as Bucky Barnes stumbles upon their location. The power of the ritual blasts away Barnes and when we see his face again, he has become the White Skull. Ah, which, I mean, you could just call him the skull because skulls are white, but whatever. Steve, on the other hand, has become a mystical super soldier wielding a shield and sporting a headdress. It's insane. He goes on to save presidents, end the war, and leave a lasting legacy of Captain and General Americas that continues all the way to the modern day. Number five, Barbarian Hulk. All right, this one requires a bit of unpacking. So, in issue 23 of What If, the Incredible Hulk has fallen in love with a woman
woman named Jarella, a green-skinned queen from the subatomic world of Kai who was brought back to our world when the Hulk was unshrunk in the actual continuity. Now, this happens in regular continuity like I just said, but she is unfortunately laid to rest after sacrificing herself to save a boy from some rubble during a Hulk battle. In this story, however, Jarella lives, and the Hulk and her are shrunk again so they can go and live happily ever after on the subatomic level in the Kingdom of Kai. Now, Kai, for some reason, takes a very medieval, Roman, slash just ancient in general approach to lifestyle, and Hulk, who now possesses his full intelligence, becomes king of the land alongside Jarella. Soon after that though, a dark plot by some dark gods and their dark minions rears its ugly head and the Hulk, alongside a group of other subatomic barbaric heroes, goes to thwart them, facing off against a second savage Hulk that came out of nowhere that seems to have been taken down in like two comic panels. It's really weird and that's where it ends. I'm assuming Hulk just kind of stays on the subatomic level and never returns to Earth living as a microscopic barbarian for the rest of his life. Probably the best thing for him, honestly. Number four, Thanos. Okay, so bear with me here. In the What If Infinity Dark Reign story, Norman Osborn, after becoming the director of Hammer and the Dark Avengers, figures out how to get his hands on the Infinity Gauntlet, defeating the Illuminati and all the heroes and becoming the Goblin King. Now using the gauntlet, he creates a world completely under his tyrannical rule, and he teleports his horrible father from the past to show him the things that he has done in an attempt to get his father's love and admiration. Something he has never had and still doesn't, honestly. His father begins to bash him for becoming a tyrannical ruler, which is a little worse given the fact that it was his father's fault that Norman even turned out this way. Teleporting them both back to the Dark Avengers base, the entire team has been wiped out. And as Norman is trying to figure out what happened, it's revealed that Thanos has shown up to collect like the gauntlet in his awesome Thanos fashion. It's actually pretty sweet. Unfortunately though, not even the Mad Titan is a match for someone wielding the gauntlet and he is dispatched, but not before he tells Norman that he is trying to get the love of someone who will never give it to him. After Thanos is gone, Norman's father, being forced by the Infinity Stones, begins to tell Norman how great he is and Norman loses it, wiping his father from all existence all time and all space, which was dumb. Because now, Norman Osborn's existence is a paradox and he, and this world that he created, fade into nothingness. So yes, Thanos is the hero here in a very, very weird way. Number three, T'Challa Star-Lord. One of the better, if not weirder episodes of Disney Plus's What If animated series revolves around a universe where instead of Peter Quill, it was actually Prince T'Challa of Wakanda who was abducted by the Ravagers all the way back in the day. T'Challa, as the new Star-Lord, convinced the Ravagers to become a Robin Hood-like group who steal from the rich and give it to the less fortunate. Under his leadership, they became icons and they saved a lot of people, recruited and persuaded lots of heroes and villains to join the Ravagers to help the galaxy, one of which even being Thanos. T'Challa heard of the orb on Morag, the one from the beginning of the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, and he goes there to retrieve it, being stopped by Korath the Pursuer just like Peter Quill was in the movie. Unlike Peter though, Korath actually recognizes T'Challa as Star-Lord and he joins up as well. He saved Peter Quill from Ego, saved Dragon Drax's family got Nebula and Thanos to reconnect and even stole a device from the Collector that could terraform ecosystems and save entire planets from starvation caused by overpopulation. You know, the entire thing Thanos was trying to fix. He eventually joins the Guardians of the Multiverse to fight the insanely powered Ultron, but that's a story for a different time. Number two, Spider Actor? In this what if number 19, Peter Parker makes the simple decision of stopping the robber who would go on to take Uncle Ben's life. That simple act robs Peter of the lesson of the responsibility of having great power, and instead, he turns to a life in the public eye. Now, as an actor, Peter Parker turns his focus towards making films and protecting his reputation at almost any cost. He becomes the publicist for both the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, as well as Daredevil, all while still retaining his Spider-Man persona. He even gets a cool cape for a little bit, and that part is, I think that's like, 
the cherry on top of this whole story. Now when JJ exposes him to the public though, we see a bit more of an edge to this Spider-Man when he threatens him and even eventually ends his career, which comes back to bite him when Jonah forms the Sinister Six, including himself. And he's not really impressive in that team, he's just kind of there. It is only after Daredevil jumps in to save Peter and fight the villains that Peter does actually learn that old power and responsibility thing, and it all goes thumbs up from there. And finally, in at number one, Intelligent Design God Hulk What If Planet Hulk. That's a long title. Most comic book readers, and especially fans of Marvel and the Hulk, know of the storyline where the Illuminati banished the Hulk from Earth to send him to another planet. He ended up crash landing on Sakaar and became a gladiator turned liberator turned ruler of the planet until his ship self-destructed, taking out his family and bringing him back to Earth with a vengeance that no guilty person was safe from. What if Planet Hulk ends up asking the question, what if the Illuminati's banishment had hit its original target? Now in this story, Hulk lands on an incredibly peaceful and serene planet. And sure, he goes a bit ragey at first because he just got banished from Earth, but he eventually realizes the planet is inhabited by a race of peaceful creatures. Little tiny peaceful creatures. Over long periods of time, the Hulk helps this race to evolve and become a thriving civilization. They end up viewing the Hulk as their god, and he basically acts as one that leads them to wealth and prosperity. It's one of the few Hulk stories that doesn't end in tears, and I'm more than happy to talk about that for that reason alone. In a 10, Ultimate. The Ultimate Universe is very similar to the normal 616 counterpart. However, there are some differences that certainly make this thing scarier than the main continuity. Captain America is anti-French for some reason. Ultimate Mr. Fantastic is a villain called the Maker. Ultimate Thanos is gold instead of purple. Oh yeah, and uh, Ultimate Magneto is way too dark compared to Prime Magneto. Prime Magneto hates humans, but Ultimate Magneto is like a tyrant in that he considers all humans insects. Ultimate Wolverine is shown to be interested in teenage girls, while Earth 616 Wolverine is more honorable because sure, Okay, Earth 616 Cyclops and Wolverine didn't see eye to eye, but Wolverine would never have killed Cyclops just so that he could sleep with his girl. Yeah, and Wolverine wants to sleep with Jean Grey. A teenager, when Wolverine is in his 30s, at least in the Ultimate Universe. Oh, and uh, there's also a romantic relationship between Wanda and Pietro, which is probably the scariest thing on this in this reality, on this Earth, and the reason I wanted it on this list. And at 9, Thanos wins. While the heroes of the MCU already received a little bit of a taste of a reality in which Thanos achieved his ultimate goal by erasing half the population of the universe and Avengers Infinity War, there exists a still darker universe where Thanos wins. Determined to finally impress death, Thanos eradicated every living being on planet Earth, including the superheroes and Frank Castle. The former Punisher made deals with both Mephisto and Galactus to find a new life of vengeance as the cosmic Ghost Rider and stop King Thanos' dark reality from ever happening. As time went by though, the heroes of Earth grew old and weak, but Thanos only grew stronger, his eternal quest to please death leading him to kill almost every living thing in the known galaxy, and becoming the king of what remained in his wake. Nothing. I don't know why you'd want to be king of nothing. Seems pointless in my opinion, and I'm a king, so I feel like my 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 expertise here, but whatever. Okay, as long as it's not this universe, I'm fine with it. Oh, and uh, not only that, but knowing that he had to die in order to be with death, King Thanos gave a piece of the time stone to his servant, the Rider, and tasked him with going back in time to drag his younger self to the future so that he could be killed by present Thanos. In an eight age of Ultron. Ultron 1320 comes from Earth 14622, and what if Age of Ultron number one? An Earth where, thanks to Wasp dying, Ultron is able to take over the world faster. Ultron was created to be the ultimate AI by Hank Pym, to help the Avengers utilize their function better as a team. But with the untimely death of Pym's wife, Pym went on to create a more brutal version of Ultron, which was to replace the Avengers. But with this, Ultron's sentience began to constantly evolve. He started the eradication of the human race by taking out such 
Ghostbuds as the Avengers and the Defenders while he left Pym alive to watch him suffer. Ultron and his army of Ultron Sentinels then moved to Kola, Russia so that he could bore himself into the planet's core to create the ultimate version of himself, Ultron 1320. Ultron then had his minions batter and beat Pym unconscious until he woke up to find that he himself had been turned into Ultron 1321. This version of Ultron also invaded other worlds, claiming Earth 62412, 23223, and 1 and 81223, but was stopped on Earth 45162. In its seven age of apocalypse, Earth 295 is a reality that was accidentally created by Legion, son of X Men leader Professor Charles Xavier and Israeli diplomat Gabrielle Holler. Legion believed that the only way to bring peace to humans and mutants was to kill Magneto before he could incite the anti mutant movement. He traveled back to a time when Xavier and Magneto both lived in Israel and were working at a hospital, taking the X Men Storm, Iceman, Bishop, and Psylocke back with him. Legion tried to stab Magneto with a side blade, but Xavier shielded Magneto and was killed instead. By killing his own father, Legion then made his own existence impossible. The Macron Crystal resolved the paradox by restructuring reality. All the X-Men vanished from that reality, and a new reality came into existence. Bishop, already displaced in time, remained, but the Chrono Backlash fractured his mind. He wandered Earth for nearly 20 years, and then that super-powered fight attracted the attention of Apocalypse, who then basically took over and destroyed everything. In its six, Old Man Logan. 50 years later, Logan lives with with his wife Maureen and his son Scotty and daughter Jade on a plot of land in Sacramento. Of what, what, we, what used to be California, but is now part of Hulkland. He requires money to pay his rent to the landlords of his territory, the descendants of Bruce Banner, the Hulk gang, who are a product of just a whole lot of crap, okay? <laughs> Just give me a minute. He refuses to sell his children's toys to pay for the rent, understandably, and Logan is shown as a broken old man, refusing to fight anyone and trying to live peacefully. He realizes that he will be unable to pay the rent this month, and that the Hulk gang will not accept a plea to pay double next month on its own. Oh, um, by the way, the Hulk gang is a, uh, inappropriately and unconsensually conceived group of children of the Hulk and She-Hulk, Bruce's cousin. Yeah. The Hulk gang arrives the next day to confront Logan on his lack of payment and then violently beat him, even though he was one of the most violent superheroes ever. <laughs> though Logan entertains visions of gutting the eldest Hulk brother Otis, he remains calm and just lets the beating happen. Later though, the Hulk gang kills his family, so Logan goes on to kill the whole Hulk gang. But it's still a messed up Earth, okay? It, it is. Halfway through in number 5, Earth X. The entire world has mutated due to the release of the Terrigen Mists in the air. The now blind watcher recruits Aaron Stack to be his eyes and inform him of what's going on on Earth. X-51 finds that in this new world where everyone has superhuman abilities, a young man named the Skull is attempting to take over the world. And Captain America and a band of former champions of Earth have rallied together to stop him. But there is more going on here than meets the eye. It is learned that the Celestials have manipulated the people of Earth into being antibodies for a celestial embryo that is growing in the Earth's core. With humanity in a state of mutation that is not destined to happen for another 300 years, the Celestials come to cleanse the human race from the face of the Earth. Only the intervention of Reed Richards, Black Bolt, and Franklin Richards, who is now Galactus, stop the Celestials and destroys the thing growing at the center of the Earth. At the end of the battle, Galactus returns to space, and Reed has giant human torches built around the Earth to burn the Terrigen Mists out of the air in an attempt to return humanity back to their former state. In it for Ruins. While Marvel was showcasing their best and brightest with Earth 616, Ruins takes a dark and twisted look at an alternate Marvel Earth where everything could have gone wrong, and it does, in the worst possible ways. The various scientific accidents and experiments that created Marvel's heroes went extremely wrong in the Ruins reality, alright? The Fantastic Four died on their test run in space, Bruce Banner was transformed into a living mass of tumors instead of the Hulk, and Peter Parker's spider bite left him with a terrifyingly infectious disease that ultimately ends up killing the narrator of the story in the truly darkest Marvel timeline. However, this is basically how the creators thought the world would be if the super superheroes were real. It is in essence a combination of Earth 616 and our world, with the idea of what would happen realistically if this was our world being the founding thoughts for the ruined storylines. And it's hella messed up, but I, I, I don't think that in this world Bruce would grow tumors, okay? I think he would just die. 
probably from cancer, but still. Okay, it's a more realistic version, but a much, much darker version of the realism. Getting close to the end in at number three, Earth 666. First appearing in Secret Adventures number 33 from 2012. On Earth 666, everyone in the world is one of the undead, but this isn't Marvel Zombies. I was told not to talk about Marvel Zombies. The living were not endured on this world, nor do they welcome interdimensional police. The orb of necromancy was hidden by Brother Voodoo, who put it deep in Shumagorath's ego maze. In the center tower, where an undead celestial was located, and who was their god, and with the orb, they plan to spread undeath to all of reality. And it's currently in a unique position, as its population is divided between a variety of subtypes of supernatural creatures. Vampires, werewolves, mummies, among others. The divide between the various groups is social and deeply rooted, with parts of the world being ruled by various factions. However, in this world there is some hope, as the greatest heroes of the various groups are united to protect the world as the Avengers of the Undead. Basically, if Marvel met Supernatural, especially that episode where like there was, there was like the Chicago monster families and it was like a parody of the Mafia, that's what's going on. Especially because Captain America's shield is made of vibranium, not silver. Get it? Cause Cap's a werewolf this time? The alternative to the number 666 in some translations of the Bible is actually 616, the number used for Marvel's Prime Earth, so... There you go. But ultimately, in number two, Hulk number three. The world first explored in Hulk number three from 2021 is quite an interesting one. Here we meet another Bruce Banner who doesn't actually have a Hulk form. Instead, his game of bombs were a success. But the government then took them and then started using them against their enemies, which caused intense radiation that turns those affected into, as the military called them, bio-waste casualties, which in this reality are they are their own versions of Hulk and She-Hulk, horrifically disfigured for the most part. This Earth's version of Bruce ends up disposing of these Hulks by throwing them into the void, which even he doesn't know where it sends them. Although, if I'm being honest, this kind of reminds me of the Rick Potion number no. 9 episode of Rick and Morty season 1. You know, like uh, the one where Morty wants to go to the dance with Jessica, but he so he ends up giving her like a love potion, but it's flu season, and then Rick tries to fix everyone by turning everyone into prey mantises, and then a comp combination of like a load of different DNAs that was supposed to he equal human but doesn't. Yeah, that's kind of how I see these hulks, but to not such an extreme where Bruce needs to like change worlds. And finally in number one, the Cancerverse. The Cancerverse is a reality where life finally defeated death, with eternal life being fueled by the many angled ones. Every living being in this universe was corrupted and turned to their servitude, resulting in a universe-wide living corpse. Which means that they aren't zombies, okay, since zombies are undead and nobody in this earth can die. Before the death of Captain Marvel, with no cure or anything to save him, his terminal condition caused such distress among the people who adored him. Across the universe, all the empathetic trauma was sensed by the many angled ones. They reached out to the dying Marvel to give them one simple truth, even death may die. While Avengers, Defenders, X-Men, Fantastic Four, and other heroes were present for a vigil at his deathbed at this point, Marvel transmuted his closest allies, among them the Avengers, now the Revengers. Despite the opposition of many, including seemingly at least members of the Machine Resistance, the corrupted heroes performed a ritual known as necropsy, sacrificing the avatar of death on the spacecraft sanctuary and consequently annihilating death itself. Yeah. Number 10. Tech on. In this 2021 storyline, the Red Skull comes into a new power that removes the powers of other heroes. Tony Stark uses his technology to create the Iron Avengers. Captain America, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, Spider-Man, Wolverine, and obviously Iron Man basically the most popular Avengers, all get Iron Man-like mech suits that they can use to fight against similarly mech up villains. The whole thing was basically a partnership with Bandai Namco to create Avenger-themed mech toys. So it has no numerical Earth number. But who cares? The art is sweet, the idea is original, and the toys are kinda cool. Number 9. Earth 1048. The reality of Earth 1048 is actually the reality seen in the Marvel Spider-Man game that came out on PlayStation, plus its associated comics and novels. Seeing as this game is highly beloved by many Spider-Man fans, including myself, I thought it deserved a mention. The universe first appeared in the Marvel Spider-Man Hostile Takeover novel on August 21st, 2018 which served as a prequel for the events of the game. In case it wasn't clear, this is also the universe featured in Marvel's Spider-Man Miles Morales 
and will be the same world in the next entry to the series, Marvel's Spider-Man 2. All the games so far have had fantastic open world versions of Manhattan, some of the best web swinging in a video game so far, tons of alternate reality and original spider suits, and are all really, really fun. Number 8, Earth 8. First appearing in Spider-Man Volume 2 number 14 in 2017, Earth 8 is a pretty great place. Essentially, it's a possible future of the reality of Earth 65, a utopia where Miles Morales and Gwen Stacy got married and were part of a team called the Amazing Eight, whose members included Spider-Boy and Spider-Girl, Miles and Gwen's kids, Spider-Ham, Penny Parker and her Spider-Mech, Jerry Drew Spider-Man, and an unnamed Spider-Woman that resembled Kraven the Hunter. The Spider-Gwen of Earth-65 came to Earth-8 to ask for the Amazing Eight's help to fight Silk in her reality. Unfortunately, Miles and Gwen were on their second honeymoon, so she only got the Amazing Six out of eight, but that was enough it seems. Number seven, Earth-2319. Appearing in the New Avengers Volume 3, Number 14 in 2014, Earth-2319 is one of the Earths that dealt with the incursion. This Earth had gone through a fourth age of apocalypse, which resulted in the collapse of the Phoenix Eggs, which in turn led to Magneto forming the floating twin cities of Tian, where mutants would be safe. The floating cities ended up being the point of an incursion witnessed by the 616 Mr. Fantastic. An Illuminati team was formed on the Earth that consisted of Mr. Fantastic, Doctor Doom, Black Panther, Yellow Jacket, both Captain Britons, Betsy Braddock and Brian Braddock, Iron Man, and Emma Frost. It was basically used as an example of what the Sidera Maris, which are an army of robots created by the map makers, could do after they invaded from the incursing Earth, resulting in the eventual destruction of Earth 2319. Number 6 Dark Hole Universes Earth 21129, Earth 42222, Earth 52433, Earth 64211 and Earth 37640. Now, this one point is actually gonna cover multiple different alternate Earths in one, because they are all part of the same event. The Darkhold is basically a codex written on flesh by the elder god Cthone of all his evil works and spells. There is a stone transcription and a series of scrolls that act as the same thing. But when the true Darkhold was found by Victorious and Doctor Doom, it opened a pathway between the other world and our world and awoke Cthone in preparation for the coming conflict and to temper them with madness, which is just the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. Victorious and Scarlet Witch had Iron Man, Blade, Wasp, Black Bolt, and Spider-Man all read from the book. The problem was they read too far, were corrupted, and saw horror story versions of their lives, resulting in five alternate realities and five 2021 stories you need to read. Number five, Earth TRN 891, Dark Ages. In the alternate Earth TRN 891, after a battle with an ancient, powerful, galaxy-attacking robot that was trapped inside the Earth billions of years ago called the Unmaker, Doctor Strange opened a portal to create an EMP that would defeat the Unmaker. This worked, but Strange died before he could close the portal. This resulted in a huge EMP that shut off all electricity on Earth. This led to various wars in the post-apocalypse killing billions of people. Eventually. Things calmed down and people lived in various different communities, surviving against attacks from vampires and werewolves. In Europe, however, the mutant apocalypse had taken over and using brainwashed geniuses from around the world, began attempting to reawaken the Unmaker for his own villainous deeds. Number four, Bloodline. In the JJ and Henry Abrams written storyline from 2019, Mary Jane Watson is killed by a villain known as Cadaverous after Spider-Man is swarmed and beaten pretty badly by his minions. 12 years later, the story has a one-armed version of Peter Parker, who is now the honestly pretty bad single father of Ben Parker, Peter and Mary Jane's son. After Cadaverous returns out of hiding and kidnaps Peter to use his blood for his evil plans, it is up to the new Spider-Man, Ben Parker, with the help of his friend Faye Ito, and old Tony Stark and Riri Williams to fight Cadaverous and his minions, which includes a cyber zombified team of Avengers. Look guys, in this reality, YouTube has this algorithm thing, right? And when you like and subscribe to us, it signals to the YouTube overlords that we are worthy of being seen by all you lovely people and new people, helping us grow and continue to pump out videos like this one. So I just want to say thanks for doing that for us. 
We appreciate every like and subscribe you drop. Okay, on to the top three. Number three. Earth TRN 852, Heroes Reborn. When Phil Coulson sold his soul to Mephisto in the 2021 event Heroes Reborn, he was given an object called the Pandemonium Cube, which he used to warp reality, creating the alternate world of TRN 852. Here, the Avengers were never assembled, instead replaced by the Squadron Supreme of America, which consisted of the heroes Hyperion, Nighthawk, Power Princess, Blur, Dr. Spectrum, and Skymax. Tony Stark never created the Iron Man armor, Carol Danvers never became a hero, Captain America remained a capsicle, and the Hulk was banished to the negative zone. After the Earth 616 version of Blade ended up on this Earth, he began assembling the Avengers again, starting with Captain Popsicle. Number two, Earth 001, home of the Inheritors. First appearing in Superior Spider-Man number 33 in September 2014, Earth-001, or Loom World, is home to the Inheritors, who are a clan of very strong beings who hunt and feed upon the life force of animal totems, specifically spider totems, meaning all the Spider-Man and women of the Marvel Multiverse. Loom World is also the home to the Master Weaver and the Web of Life and Destiny, which is basically a model of the entire universe and allows for travel to different realities. The web of life and destiny and the Master Weaver were captured by the Inheritor family who used it to hunt various Spider-Men. The event this takes place in is an awesome one. And if you get the chance, I highly suggest that you give it a read. Number one, Earth 15513. There was nothing, followed by everything, swirling, burning specks of creation that circled life-giving suns. God, doom, created the light. Then there was earth. The firmament cooled and he raised up a land, this holy land, the world, and upon it, he set his kingdoms. Earth 15513, also known formerly as Battle World, and more recently as Battle Realm, is where God Emperor Doom created his new world using the power of the Beyonders after the destruction of the multiverse in the 2015 Secret Wars event. After the final battle between God Emperor Doom and Mr. Fantastic, Battle World was destroyed and became the center of the new multiverse. The remaining reality became Battle Realm, where the elders of the universe, the Grand Master and the Collector, held the contest of champions. Number 10, Earth 90213. There are tons of scary alternate universes for Peter, which isn't surprising given all the trauma he's already been through in the main continuity of Earth 616, and how frequently it seems things could have gone even more wrong or sideways in his life. In the reality of Earth 90213, from the comic What If Spider-Man Back in Black, we get to see just how much worse things could have gotten for Peter if Aunt May wasn't accidentally targeted by Kingpin's hitmen, but instead, Mary Jane stepped into their crosshairs. However, unlike May, MJ doesn't end up in critical care, she just straight up dies. This sets Peter down a path of darkness, where instead of just badly beating and terrifying Kingpin while May's life is on the line, Spider-Man is actually focused on killing killing him. Aunt May tries to beg Peter to think about what Mary Jane would have wanted and not to pursue the man responsible, but he is blinded by rage. In the end, he succeeds in killing Kingpin and is arrested by Iron Man and the authorities and taken to prison. For his part, Peter blames the whole thing on Iron Man, who in this reality, he's still unmasked for in order to show solidarity for Iron Man's Superhero Registration Act. Number 9, My Little Thanos. This feels like a weird one to have on this list, but I think it is both terrifying and adorable, which is a unique combination of descriptors for a story, so I thought I would share it with you. Also, I just really like it. My Little Thanos is another tale, likely from an alternate timeline, featured in the Thanos Annual from 2018. Back on part one, Connor talked about that Thanos wins reality from the second arc of the main story of that comic, and on my part two, I talked about another alternate timeline story from this annual. The annual is a really fun read and a good standalone collection of just short Thanos tales outside of continuity, so whether or not you pick up the main series, I would really recommend reading this issue at least. Just read the annual, even if you don't want to read the whole series. It's great. It's fantastic. In My Little Thanos, Thanos visits an adorable world of cute little beings known as the Adorals. Noticing how bright their world shines, he attempts to get whatever source of power they have that causes such an effect. You know Thanos, he's all about power. The Adorals, in general, are just enthusiastic about everything, including being subjugated by their new god, Thanos. They happily murder themselves and one another at his behest, and get him the artifact that they worship 
ship. It turns out it's just a heart that makes a squeaky sound when you squeeze it. It's a very disturbing but delightful world. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about even more scary alternate Marvel universes, I'm pretty sure we could just keep going forever. There's a lot of them. So be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Limbo. Limbo is the dimension and reality where Magic, aka Ilyana Rasputin, was held as a prisoner when she was young. She was kidnapped by the evil Belasco, who sought to use her to harness her power and also to turn her into a sort of protege for his own dastardly means. In the end, Magic ended up escaping her captor and even rising up against him and taking Limbo for herself, defeating Belasco. While Magic has her own dark side, known as Dark Child, it is because of her alignment as a hero that I am ranking Limbo a little lower than I might otherwise. Magic, you see, tends to rule over Limbo, and, you know, she's pretty inherently good overall. Still, Limbo is basically a hell dimension on its own, so it's still a pretty scary alternate reality to visit. Unless you have Magic with you and on your side. And even then, I imagine it would still be, like, a little bit scary, a little bit traumatizing, at least. Just because, like, demons and such. Number seven, Earth 21619. The Earth of 21619 takes the idea of people Peter becoming a killer of villains even farther. In The Back in Black What If, Peter feels as though he is somewhat justified as Kingpin was the one who took Mary Jane from him. He was pushed to the breaking point by her death, basically. However, on the Earth of 21619, which is the reality number given to the universe that we see in the Chip Zdarsky and Phil Noto series, Spider-Man, Spider-Shadow, it is Spider-Man's union with Venom that brings out a darkness within him, and sets him on a path where he is killing multiple villains, taking a new approach to crime fighting as he falls deeper and deeper into to the darkness that the symbiote unleashes from within. What happens with Peter also inevitably leads to another hero taking on and bonding with the symbiote later in the miniseries, and also having to face even more deadly consequences as a result of that bond. Number 6, Earth 70134. In this reality, things went down a little differently when it comes to the Spider-Man story known as The Other. Instead of embracing and accepting the spider totem within, Peter decides to reject it. Peter would rather not be resurrected than return more spider than man here. However, the spider totem wasn't the only one hoping to forge a special and permanent connection with Peter. Out in the world, Venom senses that Peter is in his cocoon and now vulnerable with the spider totem rejected and dead. The symbiote leaves its current host, Matt Gargan, in hopes of bonding with Peter and guess what? It's successful. What is born from the union is a monster who calls himself Poison. No longer is Spider-Man alive. Instead, we have Poison in his place. Poison attempts to get Mary Jane to agree to be its partner and kind of its bride, but when she refuses the offer, they decide to dig up Gwen's corpse instead. Spooky stuff. Number five, Dark Dimension. The Dark Dimension is on a whole other scale when it comes to dark, dangerous, and straight up scary alternate worlds. It is the home of the Dreadlord Dormammu, a notorious Doctor Strange villain. The other horrifying thing about this reality is that Dormammu, while residing there, becomes insanely powerful, as this is basically what fuels his own abilities, his magics, and his powers. So he is at his most powerful while in the Dark Dimension, which is also why he's probably the ruler of it, and probably also why you definitely don't want to go there if Dormammu Mamu is there. The Dark Dimension is filled with hellish landscapes, but also mind-melting trippy ones as well. So it's not just a physical hellish reality, it's also a sort of mental and metaphysical one too. Number 4, Earth 14850. This is the reality belonging to the What If story Wolverine, Enemy of the State. In this version of the well-known Wolverine tale, Logan finds himself brainwashed by Weapon X, but is opposed to becoming free of their control, as happens in 616 he is unable to be saved. His friends and fellow heroes attempt to band together to stop Wolverine by neutralizing him and saving him instead of killing him. In the end, however, this just results in many of their own painful deaths. In the end, it is up to his good friend and student, Kitty Pride, to save Wolverine, but of course, by killing him, as that's really the only way left to deal with Wolverine at this point. In the process, Kitty loses her arm and is only able to save him by phasing her hand through his head and then making it solid while passing through Wolverine's brain. Number three, Earth 811. Days of Future Past, all in all, is uh, pretty hellish, and it's not even a hell dimension. In the reality of 811, we get to see what would happen if the Sentinels actually succeeded in conquering North America. Not only do they pretty much wipe out almost all mutants and superpowered beings, but the Sentinels also end up enslaving all of humanity for their own good. 
as they see it. The Sentinels decide who gets to breed and who doesn't, marking all citizens with lettered tattoos to denote if they are human, mutant, or basically are humans with like mutant potential. Mutants are kept in camps to serve the Sentinels, and even worse, the Sentinels seem to be planning to take over the entire world, which would inevitably start a nuclear war that would destroy the planet. Number 2. Hell Technically, Hell is its own reality here in the Marvel Multiverse. It is often the name given to Mephisto's reality or realm, who is seen kind of like the Marvel Universe's devil. He claims to be their version of Satan, at least, although a few other powerful demons and entities have also attempted to claim that title as well, including Damon Hellstrom's father and Azazel, Nightcrawler's dad. Mephisto's realm is actually made up of various hellish realms and death dimensions. It typically is shown to look like a fiery, hot, or cavernous style landscape. What you typically think of when you think of the traditional, stereotypical hell of Western Christianity. Number 1. What if Doctor Strange lost his heart instead of his hands? What if Doctor Strange lost his heart instead of his hands is the title of the fourth episode of Season 1 of Disney Plus's streaming animated series What If? Possibly one of the darkest episodes of all allows us to see what would happen were Doctor Strange to have lost his love Christine instead of his hands. In this case, Doctor Strange chooses not to let go of the possibility that he might get Christine back, despite the fact that the Ancient One appears and tells him that Christine's death is actually part of an absolute point in time, which basically can't be altered without risking, well, the fate of the universe. Strange changes his own history, going down a dark path to try and find a way to get enough power to bring Christine back. Finally able to do so, just as the Ancient One warned, this does cause the destruction of the very universe that this Strange hails from. Number 10. Avengers 1 million BC, Earth 616. Alright, look, I promise this is the only Earth 616 story I'm mentioning. But given the team and the story, how can I not? The Avengers of 1 million BC came together in the prehistoric era to face Zagreb the Aspirant, basically a mad celestial. The team was made up of Odin Bor's son, wielding Mjolnir, the mutant Firehair, the avatar of the Phoenix Force, the sorcerer Agamotto, like the Eye of Agamotto, that guy, Fan Fei, the Iron Fist, the first ever Black Panther of the Panther Tribe, a mammoth riding Ghost Rider, and Starbrand. They first appeared in Marvel Legacy number no. 1 in 2017, and I'm not even going to explain the rest. Just go read it, please! Earth 76611, alternate history. In Fantastic Four, annual number 11 in 1976, Power Man knocked a vibranium cylinder into Mr. Fantastic's time platform, sending it back in time. The cylinder was split in two halves. The important to this topic half landed in occupied France in 1942 and created an alternate branching timeline, Earth 76611. In this alternate timeline, the socialist Germans used the vibranium to advance their war effort, successfully invading England in 1943 and even making it to Manhattan by 1944, taking over America by 1946. That's what half a cylinder of vibranium can do, apparently. The Fantastic Four realized what happened though. And through some confusing time foolery, they managed to prevent this timeline from replacing the Earth 616 timeline. Number 8. Earth 9591 Ruins. This alternate reality is going to be the most recent one, taking place in the 90s. The timing of this one doesn't factor so much into its story, though, as the more relevant detail is that this is the universe where literally everything goes wrong. The entire Fantastic Four, except Ben Grimm, who was replaced by Victor Von Doom, died on their test flight. The X-Men are held in a prison in Texas where they are horribly disfigured to stop them from using their powers. Peter Parker's spider bite caused an infectious rash that mutated his entire body and caused his hair to fall out. Bruce Banner becomes a monstrous mass of tumors. The Avengers all died in a rebellion. The Silver Surfer went mad, wanting to know what it was like to breathe air again. Nick Fury became a cannibal. All sort of that really lovely stuff, you know? I would not read this story unless you're okay with being upset, but I would read this story because it's good and it's interesting. Number 7. Earth 6799, 1967 Spider-Man Cartoon. Bouncing off that happy little lovely tale, we have Earth 6799, or just Earth 67, which is actually the Earth where the 1967 Spider-Man takes place. Because of that, 
This Earth technically first appeared in Spider-Man Episode 1 Season 1 on September 9th, 1967. Its comic book appearance first comes in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, Number 9, as one of the many, many alternate Spider-Man featured in this story. He also shows up in Spider-Verse Team-Up Issue Number 2, when Miles Morales and Peter Parker come to this Earth to find Spider-Man and recruit him to the fight against the Inheritors. It's super entertaining! Number 6. Earth 84243, Conan in the modern days 70s. Some people may not know this, but Conan the Barbarian is actually part of Marvel Comics. And while the era he lived in, the Hyborian Age, is part of the 616 continuity, the what if story on Earth 79213 isn't. Instead of being in the Hyborian Age though, our boy Conan gets stuck in the 20th century. After visiting the Hyborian trade city of Akbitana, he is captured by a wizard who specializes in time travel. And instead of escaping, he is transported to Manhattan on July 13th, 1977. What does he decide to do with himself? Well, after scaring off some punks and throwing an old lady in a trash can, he has a romantic encounter with a modern age lady, Danette, who shows him the Guggenheim Museum which reminds him of an ancient citadel and they go to investigate. Here, he fights off some muggers and then gets struck by magical lightning that transports him back through time to his Hyborian age. But at least he got to keep Danette's cap as a reminder of their romance. Number five, Earth 15513, 1872. Technically, Earth 15513 is Battleworld, which is actually part of the modern Secret War story. The pocket dimension of the Valley of Doom is made of another Earth's version of the Wild West, mainly the town of Tamley. Tamley is run by its mayor, Wilson Fisk, and his enforcers, who ultimately answer to Governor Roxxon. Stephen Rogers is the sheriff in this here town, and he's a bitter but just man after the death of his deputy, Bucky Barnes. Anthony Stark is the town drunk, regretful of how his weapons were used in the Civil War. Natasha Romanoff is the widow of Bucky, with Bruce Banner being the doctor of the town. The new hero, Red Wolf, tries blowing up the Roxxon Dam, which almost results in his lynching, if it weren't for Sheriff Stephen Rogers who saves him. Conflict blossoms when the agents of Roxxon, Bullseye, Grizzly, Elektra, and Dr. Octopus arrive in town and start a running amok. Another story you have to read. I promise the steampunk looking Iron Man will not disappoint you. Number four, Earth 717, Captain America in the Civil War. The what if stories are so cool. In what if Captain America, Stephen Rogers actually fought in the American Civil War instead of World War II as General America. Given powers from an ancient Native American eagle that also turned an evil racist Bucky Barnes into the White Skull, who became the leader of a white supremacist group. Because of General America's involvement in the Civil War, the Union won the war a year earlier than it normally would have. Abraham Lincoln survived his second term in office. He helped rebuild the South, suppressed the rise of a certain group of hooded racists, and prevented the Indian Wars from ever happening. He would go on to fight the White Skull and his new deadlier hate group, eventually being succeeded by a line of Captain Americas who were his descendants. Well hey there time traveler, you're from the time period where YouTube still lets you like and subscribe, right? Well, if you're enjoying this video right here, why don't you just go and hit that thumbs up? It sure helps us out a lot. Alrighty, let's get on to the top three. Number three, Earth 90214, Marvel Noir. In this alternate version of Earth, superheroes debuted in the 1920s and 30s instead of their normal timing. This Earth, 90214, brought us Marvel Noir, with subsequent noir versions of Punisher, Wolverine, Iron Man, Daredevil, Luke Cage, the X-Men, and most famously, Spider-Man. Each story is a fresh, unique, and awesome take on each character, seeing how superpowers in this world are pretty much non-existent except for a few characters. For example, Spider-Man was bitten by a spider, but instead of being based in science, his powers derived from a spider god. Or Wolverine didn't actually have claws, he just carries like brass knuckle blade things. Another example would be the X-Men, who are actually a group of sociopathic criminals, led by an Xavier who believed sociopathy was the future of the human species, which is just incredible. Number two, Earth 811, 
days of future past. Earth 811 is a future timeline where sentinels rule over North America. After their creation, almost all mutants have been hunted and exterminated. The mutants that were not killed are kept in concentration camps. Even the heroes who aren't mutants have been exterminated. The Avengers, the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, Daredevil, they're all gone. But hey, this is the future, not the past. Yeah. I'm getting there, okay? Rachel Summers, the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, uses her telepathic powers to send Kitty Pride's mind back into her younger self's body. Specifically, Kitty's mind went all the way back to the Halloween of 1980, where she informed the X-Men of what their future could become, and they prevented the assassination of Robert Kelly. The story is a whole lot more complex than that, and is also one of the most prized Marvel stories, so give it a read! Number one. Earth 311, Marvel 1602. Okay, Marvel 1602 is my absolute favorite Marvel alternate universe. Fun fact, it was the first Marvel writing escapade for superstar fantasy writer Neil Gaiman. The universe actually got its start in a different alternate reality, Earth 460, where Purple Man became president for life. Most heroes had been hunted down or had died from old age, but after Captain America is captured, he is banished away to Earth 616's 1599, shortly before Roanoke was formed, which inadvertently created Earth 311. For some reason, the presence of Captain America destabilized reality and began the emergence of heroes and villains into this world who are counterparts to many of the present day heroes and villains of the Marvel Universe. Count Otto Von Doom the Handsome, Witchbreed, which are mutants, Grand Inquisitor Enrique, which is Magneto, Carlos Javier, which is Charles Xavier, Four from the Fantastic, Sir Nicholas Fury, Peter Parqua, David Banner. The story is so interesting, intertwining actual history with superpowered beings. I highly recommend you give it a read if you haven't already. Number 10, Dark Ages. In this alternate Earth, after a battle with an ancient galaxy attacking robot called the Unmaker, Doctor Strange opened a portal to create an EMP that would defeat the Unmaker. This worked, but he died before he could close it. This resulted in a huge EMP that shut off all electricity on Earth. This led to various wars in the post-apocalypse, killing billions of people. Eventually, things calmed down and people lived in various communities, surviving against attacks from vampires and werewolves. In Europe, however, the mutant apocalypse had taken over and using brainwashed geniuses from around the world began attempting to reawaken the Unmaker for his own villainous deeds. Number 9. Hulk Future Imperfect This won't be the first Hulk related post-apocalypse on this list. Being virtually indestructible, most apocalyptic events don't really do much to physically harm the Incredible Hulk. This includes the possible future of the Hulk Future Imperfect storyline, where a hundred years after a nuclear war turned the world into a wasteland, the Hulk became the ruler of humanity inside the city of Dystopia, which is a fitting name. This Hulk had the intelligence of Banner and double the strength of the current Hulk from being subjected to the radiation of the nuclear war. The city is policed by futuristic soldiers and the dogs of war, which are robot dogs created by the Hulk to defeat the first maestro, Hercules. The new Hulk maestro is a nuclear, twisted, super powerful version of the character, and the world he inhabits is a very early 90s comic book post-apocalypse. Two universes down and I already want to let you know how much I appreciate you watching. Wow, you must be hitting that like and subscribe button a lot, huh? Well don't stop though, it helps keep our universe from becoming an apocalypse! Number 8. Marvel Universe vs. The Punisher In this universe, The Punisher interrupts an arms deal that leads to him being doused in a chemical experiment that, for Frank Castle, makes him immune to infection, illness, and disease. The chemical weapon got into the water though, and then into the food, and starting in New York, it spread to the whole world through infected travelers from JFK Airport. And all this before it started turning people into cannibals. In this universe, Spider-Man was the first cannibal to be seen by the public, having defeated Rhino in Madison Square Garden and then eating him in front of the viewers of a hockey game. After this, an outbreak spread and led to insane events including a war against the cannibals who became the dominant beings of this earth. But the real star of the show is Frank Castle, the Punisher. This is one of the greatest and most brutal Punisher stories. It plays on many of his character flaws and strengths, but the story also shows him killing so many different heroes who you and I have always wanted to see him face. Number 7, Battle World. Okay, yes, this is kind of cheating. But also not really. I mean, the apocalyptic event, the incursions, is part of the mainline continuity. 
But the battle world created by God Emperor Doom is also an alternate Earth. So... I put it lower on the list just to be more fair. But this place and the story that it is part of are just really, 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 really good. The world itself is made up of various domains, some of which were made up of the remains of other worlds and realities that are ruled over by barons appointed by God Emperor Doom. Some of these domains could have whole videos devoted to just their stories. What makes this place even cooler is that Doom's battle world was policed by a group known as the Thor Corps. It's a police force made up of different versions of Thor. I think it is just the coolest thing ever. But yeah, Battle world. I don't know. Let's debate this one down in the comments. Number six, Hulk the End. In a world where a nuclear war has wiped out every single other human, Bruce Banner and the Hulk persona inside of him are basically forced to roam the wastes. It is an extremely deep and personal Hulk story. The main conflict in this story is the relationship between Bruce, who wants to finally be able to die, and the Hulk, who wants to prove he is the strongest being on planet Earth. A lot happens, and eventually, Bruce Banner suffers a heart attack that does in fact kill him. Meaning, the Hulk persona emerges and cannot revert back to Banner, or it will die too. Leaving Hulk the only living sentient creature, which he slowly realizes means he is going to be feeling alone and cold for the rest of his life. This story is arguably the best of the the end stories. So do yourself a favor and read it. Number five, Age of Ultron. In this story, the Hank Pym created Ultron rules the world with his sentinels, having killed all of the heroes other than Captain America, Spider-Man, Hawkeye, Iron Man, Emma Frost, She-Hulk, Luke Cage, Invisible Woman, and Wolverine. Ultron isn't even here in the time the story begins. He's actually in the future, where he already won, making sure this stays the case by remotely controlling the vision in the current time. Gotta love time travel. From a hidden base in the Savage Land, some heroes go into the future to stop Ultron and are quickly defeated. But Wolverine, followed by Invisible Woman, goes to the past to kill Hank Pym. After realizing that this creates an even worse future, they go back again to stop themselves from killing Hank, instead getting Hank to put a failsafe inside Ultron that will stop him if he attacks again. So many things happen in the Marvel landscape because of this. Time travel always hurts my brain. Number four, Marvel Zombies. When an alternate version of the century that has been infected with the zombie-like virus invades the Earth of 2149, we get the Marvel Zombies story. Seems like a worthwhile trade-off to me. Unlike a few of the other stories on this list, this alternate reality story takes place during its apocalypse, which in this case makes for a much more interesting story, showing us how the superhero world is affected when you introduce a zombie infection. These zombies aren't your typical mindless zombies though. These zombies actually have seemingly more intelligence. It's just that they are possessed by a deep, uncontrollable hunger that takes precedent over almost any other emotion. The zombies quickly took over the world and eventually over their entire universe. Nuts. Number three, Days of Future Past. In this alternate Earth story, the Sentinels were created by Bolivar Trask to save humanity from the threat of mutant existence. This mutant fearing sentiment became shared by the public after the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants assassinated Senator Robert Kelly causing the newly elected president to greenlight the Sentinel program. In a classic AI turn of events though, the Sentinels realized that the only way to truly save humanity was to rule over humanity. They took over the United States and began to kill or catch basically every single superhuman, even the ones that aren't mutants. Some of these mutants were held in mutant internment centers, and thank the Lord because if they didn't do this, we wouldn't get this story where a few heroes band together to send the mind of Kitty Pride back to the past to reverse the event that led to the Sentinel Revolution. Number two, Age of Apocalypse. Ugh, more time travel. Okay, so the Age of Apocalypse came to be when the son of Xavier, the mutant Legion, set out back in time with a team of X-Men to kill Magneto before he could incite the anti-mutant movement. This went rather horribly when he instead killed his own father accidentally, causing his own existence to be impossible. This created a time paradox. In this splintered reality, Earth 295, Apocalypse began his world domination 20 years earlier, 
before there were no Fantastic Four, Avengers, or other heroes to stop him. Apocalypse took over North America with his four horsemen, who divided up the continent and ruled over other mutants, except for the new X-Men team led by Magneto, the unworthy, and those who opposed them. The story has way more happening in it that is almost impossible for me to cover in this one little segment. And it also was super important for the character and publication history of the mutants and X-Men. It's a well put together intriguing story and it deserves your eyes. Number one, Old Man Logan and Hawkeye. You had to know I was gonna talk about this. This is quite possibly my second favorite Marvel story after Marvel 1602. The apocalypse in this universe was basically all the villains winning. In the usual hero stories, Villains face against their usual villains and are always defeated, but in Old Man Logan, the villains organize themselves where simultaneously, different villains and groups of villains will go against heroes that their abilities are best suited to deal with. For example, instead of fighting Spider-Man and his spider sense, Mysterio is sent against Wolverine, and using his illusions, he got Wolverine to murder all the other X-Men. It was pretty brutal. The conflict ended up turning the United States into an apocalyptic wasteland ruled over by the Red Skull, with territories divided up and ruled over by a few different villains. Almost all the heroes are dead, or they change size, or they are working as mercenaries, or in the case of Logan, they are retired. The story set in this post-apocalyptic universe is just a work of art, and you gotta give it a read. 